This is CUNY TV, the television station of the greatest urban university in the world. As the sun sets at the end of a New York workday, the mind transitions from daily tasks to the cloudier, more philosophical regions of social issues, culture, and politics. In a democracy, every perspective on the world is important, and people in art and culture have surprising bodies of knowledge that can shed fresh light on today's reality. The following conversations with photographer Barbara Probst and documentary filmmaker and City College of New York professor Dave Davidson took place at that time of the day. Barbara Probst is a German photographer living in New York. In 2000, she began taking multiple images of actors in a single scene, shot simultaneously with several cameras via radio-controlled system. The resulting series convey a complex, playful, and darkly cinematic vision of people in time and space. The thing about art photography is it always has to distinguish itself from mm -hmm. these other forms and your work seems to me about as complicated and arty and artificial looking as it can get. Maybe it has changed that basically everybody is doing everything now. Uh, the boundaries are down and, mm -hmm. and I don't know if you can call it journalism, but it, it's probably uh, uh, more and more mixed. It seems like it used to be that journalism was all about authenticity and, you know, cap yeah. capturing this sense of being in the moment. And then art photography often distinguished itself by being more posed or more, yeah, yeah. you know, uh, but now, you know, now in fashion photographers intentionally adopt spontaneity and, you know, yeah. artists intentionally adopt, you know, a kind of sloppy or chance aesthetic yeah. and, but your work seems to combine so many of these elements at once. Yeah, I'm, I'm interested in all kinds of yeah. uh, fields of photography because I'm kind of interested in photography as it is, what, what, mm. what is photography and so I, I want to look at all these kinds of photography, whatever it is. I even did fashion photography and then I started to do nudes and, and all genres like still life and landscape and uh, portrait. When you see my work and you think of something that you know already, that mm. is kind of our common memory or com collective uh, memory, I I'm happy to hear that because I don't want to invent any pictures. I actually want to to just take pictures and put them together in my work. Is Exposure One the first one? There's work before that, mm -hmm. but it, I haven't really shown it, And but there is work leading to that. But Exposure One is, is really the first one that had everything in it that I started to use later. It was like a base for everything. What's interesting about Exposure one and all of it is that I mean the audience can't see this setup right here But we have multiple cameras and lights and <laughs> synchronized everything in that shot exposure one is actually taken um, In however many parts it's 12 12 cameras and it's yeah. taken on a rooftop very close to this apartment We're in right, right. now, so uh -huh. we have specific points in time and space and yeah. perspective all happening at the same time. All the 12 cameras were on tripods and I was jumping in the middle of a rooftop on 38th Street and mm -hmm. 8th Avenue. You um, yourself are the subject of the photograph. Yes, that was the cheapest and most practicable <laughs> way at that time and uh, the cameras had different angles and they all pointed at me dif in different angles and distances. Mm -hmm. And even f up from the, there's a machine room where a camera, po two cameras pointed down. You were able to go up there and put a camera. Yeah, it was kind of illegal, but uh, <laughs> we, we, di we did it. It was really at night and it was so cold, nobody was there, <laughs> would ever go there. So you're documenting your own crime in a way. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, there's something about it that's like surveillance. I mean, I think uh -huh. we're all being photographed all the time and don't know mm -hmm how we look or what we're doing necessarily. But I think in some ways you're referencing that maybe. Yeah, surveillance is, I, I would say, very present in the early work. Which is more kind of your street photography series uh, right. in some of them. But the rooftop picture though reminds me of a lot of the ones that I like the best, which have these, which maybe leads more into the cinematic ones, mm -hmm. where you have a backdrop 
you have actors, right. and people are doing something, but you uh -huh. get this reveal where you realize uh -huh. that it, it looks like someone jumping in front of the Swiss Alps, but they're actually really on a rooftop right. in New York City. And you're German, is that a way to combine, maybe in some ways, two realities or something? Yeah, I mean, that was kind of an ironic <laughs> idea to, right. to do that, um, because I'm going back and forth all the, the time. Yeah. And, and actually the, the mountains, the Alps, they have a lot to do with the skyline of mm. New York. It's, there is actually a Louis Trenka movie mm -hmm. from, I don't know, 30s. And there is a, um, a fade in from the, the mountains, the Alps, into the New York skyline. Oh, interesting. Yeah, and he <laughs> leaves the mountains and goes to New York to mm -hmm. try his luck. The contrast of uh, this city and any sort of natural <laughs> environment is, is super interesting. To go back and forth between yeah. the city and other places, I find right. really stimulating. Yeah, I go to Munich a lot and mm -hmm. it's the absolute uh, contrast to New York. It's super uh, conservative and, and rich and saturated and boring. And, uh, but a lot of museums and you can you can look right. at a lot of things there. But, but very comforting for those very same comforting reasons. Very comforting and, so and basically the back and forth is uh, makes you kind of sensitive for the other. And also mm -hmm. it, it kind of blurs um, your nationality. I, I don't know anymore uh, yeah. if I'm German or I'm not American, that's for sure, but I'm not, I don't feel German anymore. Yeah, I mean, I think a New, New York uh, identity is, is kind of a neutral identity right. in a way. The process you use, these different perspectives, time, space. Do you feel like you get at any more truth in having 12 perspectives on the same scene or does it just kind of complicate things? It's definitely a, a search for truth, mm -hmm. but I, I don't think that I come closer. I mean, sometimes I think that the photos are even more an obstruction to reality, yeah. actually. And, and my work shows that, that photography is actually an, an obstacle for us to perceive reality mm -hmm. because we kind of are so um, influenced by photography in all areas of our lives. Yeah. It's yeah. almost like a model. But we, we expect photography to be truth. We assume it's it's re realism we uh, assume it's authenticity in it's fact it's completely the opposite in the way it creates a fantasy vision of things and i think what your work shows in these multiple perspectives it sort of maybe unmasks that they look very different from the different perspectives yeah but the interesting thing is actually that every camera is right or every mm -hmm. every image is is not more or less right than the other yeah. so they have all the same value basically mm -hmm. in relationship to the to reality which also shows us something about our perception mm -hmm. Like the way we look and we think we are right, but actually mm -hmm. everybody is right from, but coming from a different point of view, we see differently. Come to think of it, it's kind of like a political system where everyone has a different perspective and they're trying to come to an agreement yeah. about one, yeah. one reality, one truth. The difference is that today there's no move towards each other. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's the more, Opposite. the societies mm -hmm. are more polarizing mm -hmm. and and we're not acknowledging that the other one could be right too from their point of view. Are you finding with the political context having changed in 20 years, uh, are you finding now that people are interpreting your works differently no, in the conversation? No, I, 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 I almost think it's, it's somehow timeless in that regard, yeah. that, that they also see themselves looking Mm -hmm. um, when they look at my work and they, 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 they sometimes they say they, they see differently or they see that they are only just coming from one perspective yeah. and there are others. Probably empathy, is, it's a good word for that. I'm, I, I am interested in that. And I probably was as a person yeah. Uh, always and probably it comes out in my work. I think mm -hmm. that is that is true. I think in a way your work it has some skepticism over the mm -hmm. truth value in that. It's in some ways setting up the sort of clinical system of photography yeah. too. But I'm not coming from photography actually at all and that's important <laughs> because and, and I think I'm skeptical towards photography actually yes, right. and I uh, enjoy that skepticism in my work. Mm -hmm. Somehow frustrated about photography because it's not uh, um, to me it's not three-dimensional enough. In some works more, in some works less, I'm trying to make sculptures actually mm -hmm. with my mm -hmm. work. I mean there's a long tradition of that relationship between the two, but I think uh -huh. one thing that a two-dimensional image cannot, a photograph cannot capture all sides of 
-hmm. of a sculpture, unless you're using multiple shots. For example, one work with the three boys yeah. uh, that, that uh, are the citizens of, or the burg burghers of Calais. <laughs> uh, actually, uh -huh. that's how I got to that idea. Mm -hmm. And Rodin made, uh, made that sculpture because he wanted to make um, compelling views from all mm -hmm. angles around there. So there's no front and no yeah. back. When that photograph in particular it seems kind of like a monument to its children, but it seems like a monument to ordinary people. I mean, mm -hmm. a lot of the subjects are your friends and family. And right. What's your newest body of work? The still lifes. They're almost surrealist and painterly almost. Mm -hmm. It's kind of a, a wide uh, range of works at Le Bal. Works. In the recent works, you, you've yeah. sort of maybe in some ways turned to a, a more of a cynic's position of reality being something that's a little bit distorted by uh -huh. photography or art making. Almost the tools of a painter. Not that I'm using Photoshop, mm -hmm. but actually they, they, they look painterly because they're so set up and, and the colors and the space. Yeah, more but abstracted. Yeah, but how do you mean uh, cynic? I was sort of assuming you had entered photography to try to sort of find a way to like you were you on a quest to discover reality or uh -huh. something like that, but uh -huh. you but you end up maybe more in your own imagination. Uh -huh. Uh That's really interesting. To that uh, it it takes now the opposite way that I'm trying mm -hmm. to find the truth and I'm going in to the other side and <laughs> in my own fantasy land basically. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, what is reality? Is it is it out there or is it in here or is it some combination of the two things? Yeah. This is a philosophical question. Mm -hmm. I think about all kinds of questions of perception, subjectivity, mm -hmm. and all questions around photography. So. Um, in that sense, it's, it's uh, thinking in pictures. That's mm -hmm. how I look at it. Barbara Prost's work is currently on view in a group exhibition titled Sense and Sensibility at the National Gallery of Modern and Contemporary Art in Rome. Her solo exhibition at Le Bal in Paris is on view until August 25th. Dave Davidson is a documentary filmmaker and professor at the City College of New York. Davidson's films often resuscitate the careers of marginalized cultural figures. His latest film, Cinema and Sanctuary, examines German avant-garde artist Hans Richter's inspired creation of the film program at City College in the 1940s. Is it just me or is there an uptick in interest in documentary? Yeah, it's really exploded. I, th I think all content has exploded with cable and streaming and that sort of thing. True. But when you see, you know, how documentary has really overtaken festivals like Sundance mm -hmm. and that sort of thing, if you look at the content on HBO, Netflix, independent points of view find their way into long form documentary. But also been, there's been this renaissance in short documentary. Mm -hmm. um, hopefully that's not a reflection of the collective ADD in our culture, <laughs> but it's yeah. really catching hold. Yeah. And you know, as a person who also teaches film, it, it's it's a nice workable paradigm where mm -hmm. you can work with students and come out with meaningful um, product. Yeah, I mean, it seemed like documentary films used to be kind of something that, that was something that was already, or it was like the novel version, the War and Peace version of maybe what you got from the TV news or something. But now it seems like there's such a questioning of where TV news is coming from and for what purpose. I mean, it was so hierarchical for so many years just because it was so damn expensive. And now, you know, to throw out that democratization of media, you can grab a camera from uh, B&H around the corner mm -hmm. and do something that can be broadcast around the world via the internet. So everybody can voice their opinion. Now, of course, that has a downside. Yeah. Um, and, you know, so that, that's where film education comes in to mm -hmm. try and up the level of critical thinking that needs to go into a project before right. you press the button. But can you teach creativity or is that not something that, that one does in, in um, creative disciplines these days? I think you need the grounding. Uh, if, you've, if you've got the talent, if you have the innate ability, you're a step of a step ahead, mm -hmm. but being able to have the foundation just gives you this launch pad, mm -hmm. so that you don't have to reinvent the wheel every time you step across the threshold. And a lot of people come to us from other disciplines, <laughs> yeah. and that's that's kind of been the legacy of 
of filmmaking at, at City College, right. you know, initially when the Institute of Film Techniques was founded in 1941, mm -hmm. it became a magnet for dropouts from physics, <laughs> chemistry, engineering, and you know, that was step one that they were attracted. Step mm -hmm. two, which was even more difficult, is they had to go home and convince their parents mm -hmm. that you could actually major in movies. <laughs> so, and right. that, that was the harder. Yeah, no, I, mean, I found it interesting in Cinnamon Sanctuary that so many of those kids, those so Jewish kids Jewish mostly, are like, um, from like Germany families Germany. fleeing you know, Nazi Germany or dictatorships. And then here they are in the U.S. set up to do something that's basically like proletariat storytelling. It's a, it's a hive of uh, socialists, communists, you know, thinkers. And I know that the Photo League, the group that was kind of parallel mm -hmm. to the cin cinema folks at uh, City College, that group ran aground with McCarthy eventually and got into sort of trouble trying to explain, you know, what they were doing exactly. Right. Well, particularly Leo Hurwitz, you know, because it was initially the Workers Film and Photo League. Right. So, you know, yeah. there were there were people out there that the footage spoke for itself, the, the, the photographs spoke for, for themselves, right. and they were unapologetic, mm -hmm. uh, but it was recontextualized during the, the Red Scare, and a lot of people yeah. were marginalized for a long time. Although Leo Hurwitz, for, as an example, really bounced back and did wonderful things. To me, Richter is the perfect example of why Dada happens. Like, he's a young man who fights in the World War I, has a serious injury, comes out of that thinking that the world has been shredded and, you know, all rational culture leading to that point has only led people to this kind of crazy war and it sets up this art movement that's, that's maybe you explain it, an art movement that's absurdist. Well, you're absolutely right. All of the constructs that were brought to a head, you know, monarchies, the kind of incestuous relationships between right. leaders of countries, the fact that art itself was something that was controlled by mm -hmm. the upper classes was everything that these guys were really rebelling against before the war, but once they were in the trenches and really experienced the visceral horror of World War I, then the revolution really started. Dada is an offshoot of that, um, where they just, you know, it, they didn't call their work art, it was anti-art. Yeah. You know, everything was rejected. It seems to me though Dada is kind of a transitional, because then you get into like constructivism, I know he was interested in that, which seems more reconstructive of the world maybe. That of course gets squashed by Stalin and, you know, severe fascist, you know, politics in Russia. What strikes me, um, even years after all of these arguments, there's still this question that often comes up is like, well, is photography art? Is, is film art. I mean, you even hear it now sometimes. And I know there was an episode in the um, 60s, I guess it is, when after Richter leaves City College, um, basically uh, the program is demoted to like a technical associate's degree kind of program. And it's perhaps just the interests and attitudes of a particular chancellor. Just working from the inside, it's been an uphill battle. You know, we've been bounced around the college and been owned by everything uh, there was a college of professional studies, mm -hmm. which sounds a little bit like that community college upgrade. Mm -hmm. um, and we were in a, a division of the arts, mm -hmm. and then it be became humanities and the arts, so we were a subset of that. Mm -hmm. So there's always this shuffling around that sadly you know, represents a really ossified hierarchy which is still embedded. Old fashioned. In, yeah. yeah. Really, well, the, really the idea that you know art is useless, and I think it's the photography and film's utility, its application in some mm -hmm. ways, which is why it's so important. I think as an art form. In Richter's own work, his best stuff was were his short films, and in a way, that gave birth to expressions of art that we see even in commercial production. Mm -hmm. um, he could be the father of music video, if you yeah. were, you know. So it, it 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 had its place, but just like academia, I think the consumer of motion pictures still wants to hang on to old constructs, mm -hmm. and most people, in terms of mainstream cinema, still want story. Um, they, in many ways, want a certain kind of story. But experimental film, avant-garde film, lives. It keeps reinventing itself. Mm -hmm. The digital revolution has had a lot to do with that, but has also given rise to people going back and, and finding their wind-up Bolex 16 millimeter yeah. cameras and, and having fun with, with that. So it, uh, it gets beaten down, but it refuses to die. Well, I think um, during the 20s especially, it's a period of just inventing a language of cinema. And so you can set up 
you know, the camera and tell a story in the, the way we're familiar with today, from stage to screen. The film Ghost Before Breakfast was identified by the Nazis as basically a sort of subversive oh, yeah. film. They, they probably read more into it than was there. <laughs> if it is pointed in a political way, mm -hmm. I think it's kind of hidden under the bowler mm -hmm. in a way. Yeah, I think it's the question of what, what can you do as an artist in a you know, oppressive society or artistically restrictive society, such as now maybe Cuba or in those days Soviet Union or China even today, perhaps here eventually. What can you say that is that is political or has some sort of political critique and yet get away with it within that regime? Wait, wait, shown us, he's shown us yeah, the yeah. pathway, but uh, right. he seems to be uh, in a class by himself right. in many ways. R Richter's uh, in New York teaching. He comes as a sort of Dada artist making these avant-garde films, and he's teaching documentary film, which is a really strange combination. Also, too, it strikes me that his style of teaching was very Dada, <laughs> and I'm wondering what Dada pedagogy would look like and how that functioned. The students seem to have loved him, right? They did. I mean, he, when he began teaching, he was literally just thrown into this. He, he had given one lecture. Uh, Irving Jacoby located him and said, you're coming here. You're going to be part of this institute. So initially, I think uh, the students were entertained by his lack of command of English. Um, but, but he knew how to put on a show. Um, and the films themselves were powerful. And I think that there was that profound connection where the, these working class kids from from the five boroughs mm -hmm. knew that that guy knew those guys. Right. So yeah. he knew Eisenstein. Eisenstein. You know, he, he was connected to That's all the great all. Yeah. artists. So he had that legacy that came mm -hmm. before him. And he could throw off anecdotes about, uh, yeah. about all these folks. Over time, you know, I think he mastered the language and the, rep you know, the reputation of the Institute mm -hmm. grew. So by 1956, which is coincidental when uh, his first American film wins in Venice, he's a real magnet. You know, he's, his reputation in the United States it was good when he came and grew by that time. So they moved the Institute from all night and weekend classes into the mainstream population. So that was really kind of the peak of the curve into the early 50s, and it was a very personality-based organization. I think he freaked people out. I think those guys... He was handsome, and he was dramatic, and he was... He was uh, as, as they say in the film, he walked at a 45-degree angle. He had places to go, he had people to see, and I, I don't think academia was quite ready for that. And, you know, eventually they kind of outlasted. Well, Richter left on his own terms, mm -hmm. and, but the Institute began to decline after he left mm -hmm. and ceased in 66. I think in some ways, you know, it's a little bit of a stereotype of what an art or, you know, a, a master, you know, should look and behave like, right? I mean, it's still an idea, a cliche idea we have now even of, of that kind of professor. I think he was that guy. But what was interesting, you mentioned about, you know, the, the the odd sort of juxtaposition of documentary and his, and his artistic film. You know, the kind of documentary that he was teaching was very much on the, the experimental edge. You know, mm -hmm. Giga Vertov, Man with a Movie Camera, right. Rutman's Symphony of a Great City. They, they were really right up there in the forefront mm -hmm. of experimentation mm -hmm. and avant-garde. So it wasn't a huge leap for him. Right. The other side of that equation, just in terms of his own experience, was when you know he was run out of Germany in '34, mm -hmm. so he was bouncing around Europe, uh, around Nazi Germany, for um, almost six years, mm -hmm. and he had to make a living. So particularly, mm -hmm. his friend Joris Evans uh, got him a job at Philips, mm -hmm. um, the electronics manufacturer, mm -hmm. in the Netherlands, and he made several informational slash documentary films. Mm -hmm. Of course, they're shot through with his humor and effects and things like mm -hmm. that, but they, they sold what they were intended to sell. So he actually had under his arm, so to speak, when yeah. he came to the States, a documentary portfolio as yeah. well. And he was familiar with the form. Well, I think what people tend to assume about documentary filmmaking, it's kind of a straight face, storytelling, the narrator, the filmmaker are invisible. It's just, but there are many ways to make a documentary film. I'm just thinking of young filmmakers now, like Jackie Goss or Christopher Harris, um, who do very experimental versions sure. that also tells true stories. 
Absolutely. Going old school, Michael Moore, throwing himself in front of the camera right. and, and you know, saying, follow me. Establish that new aesthetic mm -hmm. of you know, observational, direct cinema and that sort of thing. Voyeuristic, you know, come with me into this bizarre place, let's meet e Edie, Big Edie and Little Edie. Yeah. That yeah. kind of experience that you wish you could have and they suddenly make that possible. They make it look unplanned and they make it look like it was not manipulated at all where right. it, we know it's highly manipulated but hopefully with an, an, an ethical um, uh, foundation. You founded the graduate program in the 90s at City College. Uh, was Richter kind of a model for, for you in doing that? Well, full disclosure, I was on the committee that came up with the, with, the, with the idea and we worked on it for a couple of years. But in 1997, I was the, I, I was the director right. and I agreed to do it for three years. Fifteen years later, I was able to get two people to take over for me. <laughs> so yeah. it was it, that happened. But honestly, they ended up being entirely independent. Mm -hmm. At that time, I was aware peripherally that Richter was there, and I knew there was a project I wanted to get back to. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't until I was doing the deep research about Richter's ongoing battle with the administration while he's struggling to keep his institute alive. It was really the first of its kind, mm -hmm. but in the meantime, over the years, people are catching up. And he said in 1956 to the president in a letter, I have to have a graduate program. Mm -hmm. So later on, being one of the people who in, in 96 and 97 made that graduate program come to life, when I found that document, I really felt a kinship. <laughs> I, I thought, Richter, was, there was a Dada smile going on somewhere out there. Dave Davidson's Cinema and Sanctuary premiered on June 20th at the Walter Reed Theater in Lincoln Center, and it will soon follow the film festival circuit. To celebrate Hans Richter and the legacy of the first continuous film program in the U.S., City College of New York has declared 2019 the year of film.